We just had a mini staycation here in Pittsburgh and decided to spend that time going to various different tea services. So welcome to my Pittsburgh Tour de Tea 2020. In our self-imposed quest to find the best afternoon tea in Pittsburgh, we decided to do three afternoon teas at three different places around the city. At this point, I can throw together a pretty decent afternoon tea with all the food and accoutrements fairly easily at home with very little warning, but I still like to go out for tea to various places on occasion to give myself a little bit of a break because there's a lot of extra work in doing your own fancy teas and whatnot, but also to get some inspiration for my own future teas. So our first stop for our Tour de Tea 2020 was the Inn on Negley, which I've actually been to before and I did a very small cute little tea vlog, so I'll link that in the description box down below. But my husband had never been there before and he likes tea almost as much as I do. Okay, maybe not, but he does like tea. So he was very willing to go and I had a very good experience when I went the last time, so I was very willing to go again. And if anyone is curious, today's tea of choice is Harney and Sons Loose Leaf Vanilla. It's a nice sort of cozy, comforting tea, and I'm really loving this one. It's pretty new to our collection, but I really like it. I've also had tea actually downtown at the Omni William Penn. So if you're looking for a actual downtown city of Pittsburgh tea, I will also link that down below. But if you're wanting to be kind of near the city, but not directly in downtown, the Inn on Negley is a very good option location-wise. It's in Shadyside and is just east of the city, but it's not far at all, and it's not at all hard to get to. It's also in a nice, quiet, and fairly historic neighborhood. The only downfall to this location is there isn't a lot of off-street parking, so if that's an issue for you, it might be something to keep in mind. When we arrived, we were offered the choice of sitting outside on the deck or being served inside in the typical tea room. I don't know if that's just a COVID thing because the last time I was there, it was definitely at a similar time of year and the weather was very similar. So I don't know if maybe they just stopped earlier that year or if they're just trying to do more outside dining because of the whole current situation, but that wasn't an option before for us. They did have the deck covered and there were some heating units in there, so I'm sure it would have been fine, but it was just a little bit chillier than we were comfortable with, so we chose to be seated inside. Plus for me, an important part of afternoon tea is the ambiance and the setting. So if you're going to be in this historical building having tea, you might as well be in the building having tea, not out on a deck. I personally prefer to get a little dressed up for tea, put on a cute little dress, maybe try and do something nice with my hair as much as I can. But this is definitely not a formal stuffy location. I definitely saw blue jeans being worn. So just take it how you want for tea. If you want to be casual and comfortable, good for you. If you want to be like me and have an excuse to get dressed up, yay. So while the ambiance and the decor are absolutely lovely and charming, it's not something to get stressed about. They do refer to their service as a high tea, but in my experience it really is more of an afternoon tea. They serve a light offering of scones, sandwiches, and desserts from noon to four, so that definitely sounds a very afternoon tea to me. There isn't any more of the substantial items and it's not served into the evening, which is what I would more consider a high tea, but I feel like it's very just an Americanized concept that people expect, oh, it's going to be this fancy tea, then it's a high tea, and they don't understand that there's more stiff, like, different situations involved in that. So I think it's just a marketing thing and if you don't call it what people expect, who knows what's going to happen and you might not get people actually showing up. Tea at the Inn is $35 per adult and for kids 12 and under there is an offering for $16. They have a pretty extensive list of teas that they offer and that definitely changes on occasion. They had like a seasonal sort of specials tea menu on top and then there was the sort of go-to standards beneath that. And they definitely had plenty of flavors that intrigued us considering we have an entire cabinet of different flavors in our own home. That's kind of saying a lot. 
And then like some tea houses where you get one pot of hot water with one flavor of tea and that's supposed to last the entirety of your experience. Here, you're given smaller teapots of water that usually get us about three cups of tea. And as you finish that flavor and you need more hot water, which they are very willing to give you, you can change tea flavors as often as you like. I always appreciate a tea service that is gonna let me try a bunch of different teas because I kind of look at it as a chance to branch out. We've definitely found new different flavors from brands that we already enjoy, as well as entirely new brands that we had never had before that opens up a whole world of flavors. So I definitely appreciate it when places let us try a bunch of different teas. Our tea included three sandwiches, two scones, and three pastries served on the traditional tiered server. But there was one really nice touch that I greatly appreciated is that we had our server who'd been bringing us, you know, our water and our tea and all of the sort of things we might need. But then when the tiered server was brought out, the chef actually brought that out. And then he went over everything one at a time with us. And it was really nice. He definitely was not just, you know, reciting what was on the server. He actually knew everything that was on there. And then once or twice he would have like a recommendation of an order to eat things in because he knew exactly what was happening. So that was a nice, fancy, slightly different twist on tea that I don't know that I've had that before. So I thought that was really interesting. And the menu is seasonal and according to their website, it changes weekly. So I definitely had an entirely different offering of items this trip and then I did on my last trip, even though they were both in the fall. I really like that because it definitely makes it much more likely that I will have a return visit. For instance, at the Grand Floridian in Florida, I absolutely love that. It's so nice. It's very good. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely worth doing, but I've now been there several times and every time it's pretty much exactly the same offerings. It might just be like one time you get strawberry on the cheesecake and the next time you get raspberry on the cheesecake, but it's pretty much always the exact same menu. So to have a place locally that the menu changes very regularly is definitely a way to get people to come back and I know I appreciate it and it's definitely worked because I've now gone to this one twice. On this trip, my sandwiches included a cucumber sandwich, a chicken salad, and a pimento spread. But of course, in typical tea fashion, they usually have some sort of twist to each of those to make them just a little bit special. It's usually not just chicken salad, for instance. We each got a vanilla cream and a raisin pear scone. And of course those were served with creme fraiche and jam, as well as some fresh fruit on the side. The scones were very good and definitely fresh. I personally kind of feel like the fastest way typically to take a great pastry and make it meh is to add raisins to it. But even in that case, this one had raisins in it, but it wasn't overpowering. So it wasn't bad, but just not necessarily the type of flavor of scone that I will make myself at home. I also don't know that I've ever had a pear scone before, so that was a little different and I definitely liked that. Desserts included a tartlet with a lemon curd mousse and fresh berries, a chocolate cupcake with butterscotch frosting that was very good. I think the last time I had just had a plain chocolate on chocolate cupcake and it was kind of meh, but this one, the butterscotch was a nice extra twist. But the winning dessert by far was the Concord Grape pie. It was cut into sort of a square shape, more like a lemon bar than like a slice of pie, but it was so, so good. The chef did warn us that typically he doesn't give a lot of guidance in order to eat things, but he did suggest that we start with the Concord grape because that would be a little more bitter and tart if we ate that after the other much sweeter desserts, which surprised me because that pie was still pretty sweet. And as I said, it's a very old and historic building, so I definitely made sure to poke my head into the other sort of dining area rooms that are down on the main floor and easy to get to, and it was definitely worth taking a look. It's a very, very pretty building. I'm a sucker for cool old architecture. As I said, the Inn on Eggly had a really good variety of teas to choose from. It wasn't just a bunch of basic, simple things. You know, it wasn't like, oh, you have a chai. English breakfast, etc, etc. They did have some standard basics, but they also had plenty of really cool different flavors that we have not had before. 
And bonus, they keep the tea coming. As you drink it, they will bring you more and they're very generous with their tea, which I definitely appreciate. I think there's a pretty good chance we would return to the Inn on Egli again in the future, particularly if we're going to be in the area for an event or an activity. I hope you found this helpful and inspiring. If you did, remember to like the video and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications because I have more Tour de Tea videos coming and you can compare and contrast my different experiences with me. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you next time.